Hello and welcome to the Knowledge Centre stage here at ITRON Utility Week. My name is Adam Malik and I'm joined now by Susan Marinelli. Um, Susan, welcome, first of all. And uh, you're the EnergyWise Rewards uh, Programme Manager at uh, Exelon, Petco, uh, formerly. Just tell us a little bit about the sort of basis of the EnergyWise Rewards Programme, uh, how it works in terms with uh, sort of direct load control and so on, and then we can talk a little bit more about how that came about. Sure. So EnergyWise Rewards is our um, direct load control program across all of our different operating companies. Uh, we have Linux City Electric, Pepco Holdings, and also Delmarva Power. Um, so Pepco is in Maryland and DC, Delmarva Power in Maryland and Delaware, and Atlantic City Electric in New Jersey. We operate with switches, uh, Wi-Fi thermostats, programmable thermostats, and customers you know, reduce their load uh, during control events that we mandate to manage our grid, to manage our services. So um, EnergyWise Rewards has been in operation since 2009, and we are continuing to evolve as technologies change and we're moving into the space of, of connected devices. And, and you have the ability to directly connect with the customer's device within some kind of operating envelope. Uh, they don't need to get involved in that at all? That's right, we just install the device. Um, many of our devices are paging, uh, but we are moving into the Wi-Fi space. So it's seamless to the customer. They just have to agree to sign up. They also get remunerated. They get bill credits uh, for dis participating in the program. They also get some energy savings. So if, if you have a programmable thermostat, of course, having that operability in your home, control your, your HVAC systems, your, your air conditioners specifically, uh, is beneficial to the customer as well. And if we were to rewind to the starting point of, of this program, mm -hmm. you know, what was the catalyst for it? How did it come about? We were actually, um, in the state of Maryland, we were mandated to start this program. Uh, it was a suite of programs that focused on energy efficiency, direct load control, demand response was one of the, one of the programs offered. And um, we had a mandate to reduce energy emissions 15% uh, by 2015. We met that goal along with other utilities in Maryland, but as the company saw the value of the direct load control program, in Pepco, in Delmarva Power, we rolled it out to our other uh, service territories and other jurisdictions. So we look at direct load controls as um, maintaining our maintaining our operations. Um, so it's added value to us. I think the company gets value out of operating these programs. If we were to change things going forward, you know, we might look at uh, technology, how how it's different now. Um, as the program started in 2009, we were operating paging systems. Um, we still have a lot of that in the field, but we're also replacing that with some Wi-Fi based systems. We did not have AMI technologies. We did not have um, the opportunity to see if those devices had moved in the marketplace. So now we have AMI to see that, yes, these devices are reducing load. Um, we are seeing reactions on our, on our peak demand times. Um, so if I were to look now, um, the market's changed so much, you know, the internet of things, there's many more devices that we can connect. There's also um, the way the RTOs are creating different rules and regulations. Do we have to comply, not just in the summer seasons, but there are there winter opportunities to reduce demand? And that could be very interesting for some of our customers, like some of uh, our utility partners that are maybe in the south of our country have more electric heating. So there's a lot of factors that kind of bleed into all that, and I think someone starting out would really have to look at what is the business need that they have, how can they leverage the various technologies that are in the field now, and, um, and so, sort of create that connected landscape for, for load control. So in terms of business need, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I mean, a lot of times, a lot of these programs start from a regulatory mandate, mm -hmm. you know, and then say, right, and you are just complying with the regulation. But if you look back on it now, I mean, you say that you know the benefits, this is what I'm hearing from you, the benefits that you're getting out of this would mean that this is something that you would do even without the regulatory mandate. And if you needed to, you would make the argument for it because it's giving you so much uh, benefit operationally. Operationally, yes. Um, we. We know we're able to provide stability uh, to our to our system. 
Um, but also I think that there's definitely a financial benefit as well. You know, we participate in the PJM market and um, we, we participate in capacity as also wholesale energy markets. And so our revenues that we realize from being able to offer this service into that RTO uh, so is substantial. Flexibility as a service. Yes, flexibility to the RTO, and we are are you know earning millions of dollars on that annually. So it is definitely a, a benefit to the utility to participate. And again, going back into the sort of roadmap of how you would start. What were some of, I mean, we learn more from when things go wrong than from when things go right. I mean, what are sort of the, some of the lessons that you can share with people watching this about, look, we thought this was a good idea and it wasn't. And here are some of the lessons out of that. Your infrastructure is really important in this. Um, as I mentioned, we had a lot of paging devices uh, that we installed initially. And using cell towers, using that radio signal is, is very easy and it's good and it's reliable um, to a point, but you also have to be able to check to make sure that that device is still in place. And before we had AMI technology, you know, we would literally have boots on the ground kind of scanning the, scanning the um, where our, our devices were installed to make sure that the signal strength was reaching where it should be reaching. Um, and so without having that feedback, only having that one-way communication, you never had that feedback loop. And now, fortunately, with AMI and also with Wi-Fi devices, you're able to use your AMI data to make to say, yes, we did operate a load control event, and here is the verifiable proof that that our devices, you know, responded. Are you still using the mobile network, or are you saying that actually all three play in tandem? Well, now we're using things? all three because right. we have a lot of investment in our infrastructure as it is, and so we have our paging devices in place. We also now have Wi-Fi devices, and over all of that, we have AMI. So we're able to look at our AMI data and say. Okay, we have you know we have to make sure that these premises are participating. Maybe we have to do some uh, remediation there, um, but it's also a great opportunity for the company because we are able to get better technology into our customers' hands, um, offering them a Wi-Fi thermostat, offering them to participate in direct load control through a bring-your-own-device model, where they're able to have those app those apps in their hands on their phones, reduce their energy use, and also participate in the load control events. It works out. It works out for everyone. Well, you've teed me up quite nicely uh, with that answer because you mentioned bring your own device. Mm -hmm. And it's been one of those things where the world over utilities have been wrestling with this. You know, do, do we put this in and do we actually buy the devices and take the hit and push them out mm -hmm. or, or do we give our customers the opportunity to connect with everything? How do you see it? I mean, it sounds like you're going down this bring your own device route, but there must be challenges because they're all on different standards. They all have different things. There are challenges. We're wrestling with that right now. Um, part of what we're doing with our Bring Your Own Device uh, program, which we are just working on rolling out this year, is we have a thermostat optimization side to it. So there is a, a different platform that we're using for that. Um, but we strongly believe that there's, there's benefit to the, con the customer to be able to participate with the device that they want to have. Um, one thing I do think is very good about the IntelliSource platform that we use is they are able to bring other devices into the fold. So we are starting to look at that, experiment with that a little bit, um, build those devices into our topology of, of our network um, so that we can also use those devices to target, you know, if there's a specific need on a feeder. We'll be able to see not only what we've installed, but what our customers have installed and pull that into um, a complete you know, operational solution. So um, bring your own devices is, is just a whole new world that, that we're also thinking about what else might come into play. Are we gonna talk about grid tied you know, water heaters? Um, what, what is gonna be that whole home solution that could, could, that could help us uh, with our demand response? Because what you're really talking about is like a, it's almost like an open data model in a way, right? You're saying, well, this is, this is our data model, these are our standards. If your device can plug into that, you can play, and that creates innovation. Yes, and that was something I was really um, pleased to hear about this morning at the general session, was um, 
you know, iTron also looking to try to be more flexible and not just play with one particular party, but bring many parties into the fold. And I think that that's, that's an important piece of any direct load control moving forward because there is going to be that variability, but I think also through open networks, um, you're going to be able to build on, on that solution and make it a broader, a broader platform. How important do you think this concept of direct load control is? Because people, again, around the world have always been saying that actually if everybody moves their devices at the same time, we can actually create all this flexibility. But no one's going to jump up every three seconds. I'm belittling this a little bit and you know, turn on their washing machine just because they've got a signal. And so, you know, do you feel that this type of relationship with the customer, and I want to explore the relationship with the customer a little bit, of direct load control is the only way we will have the flexibility that will balance out the distributed energy resources that we're going to get. No, I don't. Actually, um, our direct load control program is coupled with a peak time rebate program or our behavioral demand response. So we do give customers advance notice to take action um, to reduce their energy use at, at certain time periods. But we couple that behavioral piece with our direct installed piece. So I think the two sides of the coin work together. I think you absolutely need to have automation in the system. And I think customers um, appreciate that. They like to have the, the heads up, the awareness that something's going to happen. It's also important, I think, for the, the company offering the direct load control program to provide an out for their customers. You know, For instance, we, we let customers um, opt out of a direct load control event twice a year. Um, so, to, to kind of bring it back to your question is um, I think I think having that flexibility, you know, you need to have some ownership on the part of the customer and, and provide the benefits to them, uh, whether that's monetary or flexibility or technology, but also have the automation because then you know you have that verifiable uh, you know, resource that you're able to, to maximize um, and, and get that whole load picture. So, so what you're saying is that the, you know, the partnership between the customer and what you're doing and, and what they're able to do is, is absolutely critical and you, you need that relationship and that engagement. How does that work in real time? You know, is that being helped by sort of modern technology that we've got? You talked a little bit about, hey, if I were to do this again, I'd do it somewhat differently. I mean, in that customer engagement area, is there any way that you would maybe attack that differently with the technologies we've got now? It's been evolving for us. Um, we now you know, reach out to customers through their preferred method, so uh, options for them to select whether they're going to get an email, a text message, or a phone call. Um, certainly as the, the bring your own devices come into the field, we're even going to be able to ping those devices and say, Here, what, here's what's going to happen. How would you like to prepare you know, and, and give customers those options? So that just, I think, leads to customer satisfaction and customer engagement. And if you can um, know, like you mentioned before, and everyone's not going to be reacting you know, at the turn of a dime, but giving them that advanced notification, we try to do it at least 12 to 24 hours in advance, um, I think is, is beneficial to the customer and, and does provide an added service, which isn't that what we're trying to do, is remain relevant for the customers. Absolutely. And just a final question to you uh, uh, as we come to this. Okay. Where do you see those services progressing? I mean, if you, if you could fast forward, let's say, five years and so on, you know, are there sort of new things? Because everybody's talking about the, the utility or, or the infrastructure owner being able to diversify services, not just energy services. I mean, what are the other things that you can see coming towards you that you're being able to offer? Where do you want me to start? Uh, <laughs> You've got two minutes. <laughs> um, that's... I think that's what we're really looking at right now, is uh, how do you take um, direct load control, all these connected devices, how do you look at electric vehicles, um, even participating in, in demand response as well? Can we use, are we going to use our vehicles as batteries? Um, solar, how does that play into things? And I think the customers, what, what's really becoming apparent to me is, you know, customers are starting to only think about electricity when it's not on, right? We have, have such reliable service um, 
and customers just kind of take advantage of that and don't think about it. But if we can still, if we can provide those other services that help them manage their home's energy use, help them participate with technology the way they want to, customers want to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, you know, seeing solar panels come on online, we have. Um, really constraints, we're starting to see constraints, you know, in our system um, and, and have to almost not allow some grid ties. Um, so the long story short is how make, making sure that customers can, can still operate with the technology the way they want to operate and uh, be nimble enough to communicate with them to have just all these, all these connections in their home. And at the same time, not forget about, you know, customers who maybe might be struggling to pay with pay their energy bills. How can we also offer services to um, you know, energy use information to help customers better manage their bill? So you have to, the utility of the future, I think, has to look at their least common denominator customer as also look as our customer that is, is going to try to yes. advance technology and advance the Because ball. we don't want to create an energy divide. That's right, that's right. On that note, we'll leave it. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Thank you as well for watching this interview at the Itron Knowledge Center here at Itron Utility Week 2018.